Uh, we now have a uh, basically a concluding keynote for our conference, and then at the end I will make a few remarks. Uh, but right now it's a great pleasure to introduce Ellen Ray. She doesn't really need an introduction, but for those who lived under the rock, uh, Ellen is teaching uh, economics at London School of Business. Uh, most people, I think, know her for her contribution to understanding of the global financial cycle and um, her contribution to the discussion of external imbalances. However, if you look at the body of Ellen's research, it uh, contributes to a vast spread of topics in international macroeconomics and finance. And in many cases, her research led to a breakthrough or was a breakthrough in our understanding of the global financial system. I'm really looking forward to her keynote address on uh, global portfolio rebalancing and exchange rates. I think the understanding of the portfolio composition is one of those under-researched topics in international finance. And so I'm really looking forward to what Ellen has to say. Um, you have about 45 minutes, Ellen. We'll leave 15 minutes for Q&A. Super. Thank you so much, Galina. And uh, I really congratulate the organizers for a really interesting conference. I, I enjoyed very much listening to the paper and it gave me a lot of, uh, of ideas uh, for the research. It was really great. Um, do you see my slides right now? Okay. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So I'm going to, um, uh, to talk about joint work with uh, Nelson Camano and uh, Harald Hau. Uh, Harald Hau is in uh, Geneva and Nelson is at uh, Queen Mary. Uh, and uh, I'm going to um, uh, address a, a type of question that indeed I think like Galina is a bit uh, under research, which is the interaction between uh, asset markets and so international financial flow uh, and exchange rates. Uh, and uh, a lot of, um, of, of papers had very interesting things to say about exchange rate movements in, in this conference, but I think we can make some um, more contributions also on the um, links between international portfolio investment decisions using microeconomic data uh, what uh, these international portfolio investment decisions mean for asset prices and for exchange rates jointly. So this is really a, a body of work here that I, uh, I'm uh, trying to contribute to, uh, which is about linking these asset markets together, and in particular equity markets, as the case will be uh, in this paper, with uh, exchange rate markets. Indeed, uh, they are in the, in the literature, there is a tradition at uh, looking at capital flows and, uh, and exchange rates. So it's a pity that uh, Richard Lyons could not be with us today because obviously uh, there's, there was some very influential contribution of Martin Evans and Richard Lyons uh, back uh, in the 2000s, linking uh, order flows uh, and, and exchange rates, so flows and exchange rate. Recently already mentioned there was this paper by Lille and co also looking at correlations uh, between, uh, uh, between flows and, uh, and exchange rates. But uh, there is a broader literature, which was uh, the literature of the portfolio balance models uh, with Penticori and, and other contributors in the 80s, which was precisely about this type of issues. Uh, but has been a little bit um, on the back burner because of the lack of, uh, of micro foundations. Though we are seeing uh, a kind of a new wave of, uh, of a contribution in that literature. I listed a few, uh, a few papers here which are very, very different in the, the, the way they model things, the way they model frictions, uh, but in a way all try to speak to these links between asset prices, capital flows, uh, and exchange rate. And I, I missed a lot of, uh, of the literature also uh, here. So this paper specifically will present an equilibrium model of uh, optimal uh, portfolio rebalancing in a two country model within compete markets. And it's gonna be a model of the uh, equity markets and exchange rate essentially. And I say equilibrium model, but it's not general equilibrium. You will see that uh, part of the economy is rather uh, not modeled here. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, with this simple equilibrium model, I will draw some uh, empirical implications, which will have to do with uh, 
the portfolio composition. So we'll see home bias. We'll see also the dynamic dimension in a way of, of home bias, which is how valuation changes will induce some rebalancing uh, between the, the domestic and, and foreign shares of a portfolio. And we'll also see how this uh, rebalancing uh, changes with the volatility of a foreign exchange market, which is going to be endogenous in the model as well as how the flows will feed back on, uh, on exchange rate dynamics. And I will also explore in the data, so this, uh, uh, these empirical predictions, and I will also explore heterogeneity across funds, across uh, equity funds um, and for various dimensions, how they, relates to, they relate to the portfolio rebalancing behavior. So in order to do that, we'll have a, a very large cross section of international equity holdings and um, that will allow us to, to say quite a few things because there's a lot of power uh, in the cross section. So in terms of the type of results we are going to get, we are going to find that indeed uh, international equity funds uh, seem to uh, rebalance their portfolios in a way that, uh, uh, that will be uh, uh, compatible with, uh, with our model. Uh, and I will be more, much more specific about that, of course, in a, in a minute. Uh, we will find that this rebalancing behavior tend to be amplified uh, by foreign exchange volatility. Uh, there will be some heterogeneity in the cross section and we will, uh, we will see that for funds, some relevant dimension of heterogeneity seems to be uh, their concentration and their size. Um, and we will also uh, use a, uh, a GIV approach, a granular in in instrument variable approach at the end of the paper to, uh, to look at the causal effect of uh, flows on exchange rate. So that's a preview of, uh, of what awaits you uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So let me present the model and then draw the empirical implication and show you the empirical results. So the model is simple, uh, at least uh, in its ingredients, then it's not so simple to, to analyze it. It's a model where uh, there is incomplete market and uh, there is also segmented market in very uh, stark ways. So it, the, um, what is really important is that it's not possible for these equity uh, investors uh, that I will show you to uh, hedge foreign exchange risk. So in particular, that will restrict quite a bit uh, the asset space. They will be able to invest in domestic equity, in foreign equity, in domestic riskless bond. Uh, and in, uh, uh, but they won't be able to invest in the foreign bond. Of course, the foreign guys, they can invest in their own domestic riskless bond. So there will be rebalancing across the equity uh, dimensions internationally. And uh, within each country, there is rebalancing between the safe asset and the bond uh, for each of the individual country, but not across country. Otherwise, in such a simple model, uh, exchange rate risk could be hedged and, um, and uh, we uh, rule that out. We rule that out because we also uh, observe uh, that, uh, uh, for that equity trader, equity funds do not tend to hedge um, foreign exchange risk as opposed to banks, for example, or to some extent also to bonds, to bonds traders. Uh, but this is an assumption in the model. So that's a strong assumption, that's a stark assumption. Uh, then we have uh, two equity markets, so one in the domestic economy, one in the foreign economy, which are going to be modeled as uh, exogenous dividend payoff processes. And as I already said, in each country there is a riskless bond, which is in full price elastic supply. Okay, so that's why this is not general equilibrium in the sense that we are not modeled this full price elastic supply of a riskless bond. We're just going to assume it's there. Now the exchange rate is going to be determined by the equilibrium between the demand uh, for currency coming from uh, the international equity investments, uh, which will come from buying uh, foreign assets and repatriating dividends. Uh, and um, the, so that's going to be the demand, the net demand for currency. And what is the supply of currency going to be? It's going to come from risk averse foreign exchange uh, liquidity suppliers. So supply meet demand will uh, determine the uh, uh, exchange rate in this model. So how exactly do these things work? So here is uh, how we formalize everything. So home doesn't have a star. 
the star is for foreign investors. Uh, each um, international equity investor choose portfolio weights, which are the HTs here at each point in time. This is in the continuous time. So the home investor uh, uses, um, so buys some uh, home uh, assets, home equity, which is going to be the HTH, and also foreign equity, HTF. And similarly, the foreign investor has a star and does the same thing. It can buy home equities and it can buy uh, foreign equities. Both investors are mean variants investors, so they solve a relatively simple optimization problem. They maximize their portfolio weights. Uh, they, they maximize the, the portfolio weights in order to get a maximum uh, uh, discounted uh, profit here. It's, uh, it's mean variant, so we uh, effectively cut off anything which has to do with intertemporal hedging motive uh, in order to get linear asset demand functions. Uh, so that simplifies things a lot. And R is going to be the, the risk test rate, which we are going to assume equal uh, in both countries. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the setup. And the investors do not uh, take into account their price impact, neither on asset prices nor on the exchange rate, okay, which is, seems a fair assumption at this stage. Okay, so now what are the dividend processes that we, um, uh, that we actually uh, assume? Uh, for, the, um, uh, so for the two equity markets. These are the uh, continuous time equivalent of the AR1. So this is the einstein ullenbeck processes. Uh, here it is for the home equity market. Uh, this is, uh, we assume this uh, uh, mean reverting process here. Uh, and we assume for simplicity, again, complete symmetry between the home market and the foreign market. So we assume the same parameter um, for these two um, austin ullen back processes. Now, if we didn't have this uh, structure of imperfect uh, risk sharing um, between the two countries, uh, what would be the fundamental value of an equity, let's say in, in the home economy, let's say it's a closed economy, and we have only this uh, home equity uh, investor subject to this um, uh, dividend process? Well, the fundamental value of, of equity in such a case would be simply what we call the fundamental value, would be uh, not taking into account anything about foreign exchange, the foreign dimension, exchange dimension, would simply be the expected discounted sum of these dividends. And uh, that's very simply, uh, simply uh, uh, written in, uh, in, in, in this case with uh, just a constant plus uh, uh, parameters times the, the DTH, the dividend. So that, that's a very simple, um, fundamental value for, for the equity market. That would be for the home market, that would be for a foreign market. So we denote these two things by F. But of course, in our model, because the, um, because the optimization of a portfolio will take into account the exchange rate risk and the price of the equity and the price of the exchange rate will be jointly determined in equilibrium, uh, effectively the price of the equities will deviate from this uh, very simple formula. Uh, and, uh, and that will be interesting. Okay, what about market clearing? Well, so for equity market, we assume that the supply of, uh, of equity is just one in each country. So we just have the demand of a home equity by home and foreign investor, uh, their sum is equal to one. And same thing for the foreign investor, the sum of uh, demand of equity by the domestic and foreign investor is equal to one. Now, uh, interesting uh, equation for the foreign exchange market. What is happening there? Well, we have a net demand for, for, the, um, for the currency, which is coming from the uh, investment behavior of the domestic and, and foreign investor. So what does it mean? There are two terms for each investor. One term is simply the uh, investment of, for example, here, the domestic investor in foreign equity. So that term would be the price of the foreign equity multiplied by uh, its changing weight uh, in the foreign equity. So that would be this term. And we have, of course, a symmetric term with an exchange rate here uh, for the foreign investor. And then there's also the dividend repatriation term. So the, the domestic uh, investor is going to repatriate a dividend according to his holding of foreign equity and similarly for the foreign investor. 
So all these four terms constitute the net uh, demand for, uh, uh, for a currency. And here I've defined the exchange rate as when it goes up, uh, it means there is a foreign uh, depreciation. Okay, so that's the net demand, that's DQT. Now, how about the supply? Well, the net, uh, the net uh, supply for the currency uh, is, um, is given by uh, a global arbitrager who is operating so, uh, in a completely segmented market. So that foreign exchange market is separated from, these, uh, uh, from the equity market trading. Uh, and uh, we can think of uh, this arbitrager as being a risk averse global arbitrager. Uh, who is going to have essentially a price elastic supply curve with an elasticity parameter, which is going to be kappa. And effectively, we will be able to estimate that, that, um, that parameter uh, in the empirical part. Uh, but what, uh, what could justify such um, uh, a functional form? Well, you can see here that uh, this is, a, this is a, a foreign exchange supplier who is going to provide currency whenever uh, the currency is above its uh, long run, uh, uh, is, is be, whenever this uh, is going to buy, buy currency whenever it's cheap compared to its long run value, which here uh, we will normalize to uh, E bar. So this is a kind of contrarian trader who is providing uh, liquidity to the foreign exchange market. So it could be microfunded by having again a mean variance uh, utility function uh, for a trader. Uh, who is facing an exchange rate who is essentially mean reverting. So that would give you uh, a supply curve which is of, of this shape. I think another way one could interpret it is as a reduced form function of a real side of the economy, but um, that would be uh, uh, coming from, uh, uh, from trade uh, balances uh, where you would have um, uh, fluctuation than exports and imports, which depend on the uh, relative appreciation or, or depreciation of a currency compared to its long run value. So that would be another way of interpreting it. So we use this reduced form here uh, for simplicity. And as I said, kappa is going to be a, an important parameter in the model, as you will see, and we will have something to say about it also in the empirical part. So that's the currency supply part. Uh, the currency demand uh, I showed it to you before. I'm just going to rewrite it uh, very uh, slightly by uh, grouping this uh, net dividend flow term here uh, to make it a little bit easier to read. And so we will, we will have a currency supply meeting the currency demand, which has these two parts, the net dividend flow and uh, the investment in, a, in, a, in equity market by both the domestic and the foreign investor. So at this stage, maybe I should say uh, one of the uh, prominent uh, papers recently uh, on exchange rate determination also with capital flows is the paper by, uh, by Xavier uh, Gabex and, and Matteo Valdiori, where they have um, also a friction, uh, some friction on the, uh, uh, <laughs> for the arbitrageur, uh, which is based on a, on a balance sheet friction. So I guess uh, the big difference between uh, this approach that I'm presenting today and, and their approach, uh, which is also very interesting, is that in our case, we are really looking at the optimal decision of, uh, of investors in terms of optimal portfolio decision and exchange rate determination. So the exchange rate will depend on uh, whatever happens on the financial side of this, uh, of this economy, of the portfolio decision on the equity prices on the portfolio flows. Uh, whereas in, in, uh, in Xavier and Matteo's paper, uh, the exchange rate depends from on, on purely on the, on the real side of the economy, on uh, the transactions that are generated by the trade balance um, transactions. So uh, they don't have endogenous capital flows uh, in their paper, but on the other hand, they have a general equilibrium framework uh, which they simplify to get uh, analytical solution. So that's that's big difference uh, between the two approaches uh, that we have. And so in their paper, they don't have equity or or, or risky uh, risky asset. So what do we um, what can we do here? Uh, so we can solve for this uh, for this model. I have shown you the. Um, uh, 
what the investors do, the market clearing conditions, the conditional foreign exchange market. Uh, so uh, we can uh, derive the optimal demands for equities, which depend on the exchange rate, and then we can jointly solve uh, for the equity price, the um, shares, the portfolio shares, and the exchange rate. So that's what we are going to do. We have to solve for PTH, PTF, which are the equity prices, ET, the exchange rate, and the optimal holdings of both the domestic and the foreign investors in domestic and foreign assets. So what we can... Um, show uh, in, the linear, in the linearized model. So you see that this model is entirely stationary because we have assumed more stimulant back uh, processes. So we can linearize the model around the steady state. And within that uh, linearized class of linear model, what we can show is that um, there is a unique equilibrium provided some conditions on the structural parameters are satisfied and we can solve for that equilibrium. So what are the conditions of the structural parameter? They have to do with rho, which is the risk aversion of the investors, and kappa, which is the same as kappa, the elasticity of the currency uh, supply here. And if rho is sufficiently small and kappa is sufficiently big, meaning if the investors are not too risk averse, and if the elasticity is uh, sufficiently high, then we are going to be able to solve uh, for an equilibrium in which there will be international diversification. So domestic investors will hold foreign assets uh, and vice versa. So why uh, these restrictions on the parameters? If uh, there's too much risk aversion or uh, the supply of foreign exchange is really inelastic, you have so much volatility essentially that uh, nobody wants to invest uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, foreign asset. There's just too much risk uh, linked to the foreign exchange uh, risk here. So that's, that's where these um, restrictions come from. So provided we are in this parameter space, uh, then we can um, derive a property of the equilibrium. And this is what we call the portfolio rebalancing equilibrium. So as I said, uh, the main characteristic of this model is that it gives you a joint determination of equity prices which are PTH and PTF, and the exchange rate, as well as fluctuating portfolio holdings. So let's look at the properties of these things. So what is really interesting is that you see that the price of the equities depend on these fundamental values, which are essentially the, the expected discounted uh, dividend flows. Okay, so these are the fundamental values of these, equity, uh, uh, of these equities. But also there are these two stochastic processes here which appear in the solution, uh, which are also in the uh, exchange rate, which, which are in difference, essentially, of the two um, austen ullenbeck processes between the home and the foreign uh, country with uh, different time scales. But these are uh, essentially so two stochastic processes that, that appear in the solutions, both for the uh, domestic and foreign equity and the exchange rate. So you see that there is going to be there is going to be some commonality here in the pricing of these uh, of these risky assets, and and I think that's quite uh, that's quite interesting. Now, in terms of the portfolio holdings, the model automatically generates a home bias because the assets are rigorously symmetric, except that when a domestic investor invests in a foreign equity, it faces also foreign exchange rate risk. Okay, so, and this is something that uh, uh, is going to, he or she is going to dislike, and therefore there's going to be a home bias, which is generated from this, ex this extra volatility due to the exchange rate when one invests abroad. So this is why you have this uh, asymmetry in the uh, H bar is going to be uh, smaller than 50%. So there is home bias, uh, which is generated, and we are fluctuating around this home bias uh, position. Uh, in a way that again reflect these um, uh, these two stochastic processes here that uh, that we find uh, that we find. So this is a home bias equilibrium. We can ex we can uh, express all these uh, parameters in terms of the fundamental structural uh, parameters, which are the mean reversion of the austen ullenbeck processes, the volatility of the uh, dividend process, and then the uh, uh, the other scaling parameter, the risk s rate, and kappa and rho, which are very important parameters. Again, the elasticity of supply of foreign exchange, and rho is uh, the degree of risk aversion of the two investors. So that's the characterization of the equilibrium. 
very interestingly, we can nest the perfect twist shearing equilibrium. When do we do that? If the elasticity of currency supply is perfectly elastic, so the exchange rate doesn't move essentially, <laughs> then in that case, you go to an equilibrium where the exchange rate is equal to one constant, okay, everything is symmetric, so the exchange rate is equal to one, and uh, the equity price converge simply to their fundamental value, there's no exchange rate risk, and we have H bar equals 50%, so there's perfect risk sharing. So we can nest to a perfect risk sharing case uh, in, uh, in the model. But it's gonna be a lot more interesting when kappa is, uh, is not infinity, obviously. Now, what are the properties of, uh, what can we say about what the equilibrium looks like again, now that we have this, uh, these parameters? Well, we, we are gonna look at the uh, covariance, the co-movements between the change in uh, portfolio weights, so here, the HTF is the investment of the domestic investor in foreign equity with uh, the rate of return differential between the foreign part of his or her portfolio and the domestic part of the portfolio. Okay, so that's going to be the differential in return between foreign equity market and, and home equity market. And we look at uh, how these uh, different uh, realization in the dividend process at home and abroad may affect uh, the investment behavior of um, the home investor. And so what is interesting is that um, wh what we find is that this covariance is negative. And why is that? Well, uh, what's happening is that uh, each investor uh, has some uh, optimal portfolio. And then of course, there are these shocks hitting the dividend processes all the time. And if the foreign part of his portfolio um, suddenly becomes uh, larger because there's a positive um, dividend uh, shock in the foreign equity market, then that means that that, that particular uh, investor, the home investor, is going to be now overexposed to foreign exchange rate risk because uh, all the foreign part of his portfolio is facing uh, volatility of exchange rate, is facing the exchange rate risk, whereas the domestic part is not. And other than that, everything is symmetric. So there is this wedge, which is introduced by the volatility of exchange rate, by exchange rate risk between his investment abroad and his investment at home. So if um, suddenly there is an overvaluation of its foreign share of uh, foreign investment, foreign share of investment, then that investor is going to repatriate capital into the domestic stock market in order to decrease its exposure to this uh, foreign exchange rate risk. So that's a rebalancing um, mechanism essentially. And, um, and this is what uh, the model predicts, and we will, um, we will look at uh, what happens in the, in the data. The second thing that the model gives us is uh, this rebalancing. What happens when the volatility of the exchange rate is actually higher? Uh, so do we see more rebalancing or do we see less rebalancing? And remember what the volatility of exchange rate does in this framework is that it creates a wedge in the return between the foreign part of the portfolio and the domestic part of the portfolio. And so if the foreign appreciates, I want to repatriate my capital to rebalance. Uh, so here we are looking at the comparative statics of an unexpected increase in volatility of the foreign exchange market. What does it do to the rebalancing coefficient? And we find that more volatility uh, increasing, increases the strength of rebalancing. So this beta is rebalancing coefficient, it's negative, and it's more negative if uh, the volatility of the foreign exchange rate uh, is higher. So more FX volatility leads to more rebalancing uh, in, uh, in the model. I'm just illustrating what I just, uh, uh, just said uh, in panel B, but in panel A, uh, you have a link here uh, between foreign exchange volatility in the model and kappa, this famous uh, elasticity of supply. Okay, as, as, as uh, you would probably guess, uh, as kappa goes to infinity, this is a perfect question in case there's less and less volatility. And as kappa becomes smaller, there is more and more foreign exchange volatility. And here you have a different uh, line for a different uh, volatility processes on the under, of the underlying dividend processes. Okay, so more inelastic uh, FX supplies means more FX volatility. And here you have the beta, this rebalancing coefficient 
how does it vary with uh, foreign exchange volatility? As uh, there is more volatility, it becomes more negative. Okay, so this is what I, I just said and showed you in the, in the model. So we are going to test these basic implications, but then we are also going to push the data a little bit more because we will explore uh, heterogeneity in rebalancing behavior across funds, uh, asymmetry in returns, uh, that's, that's what we're going to do. And then we're also going to test this other part of the model essentially, which is that uh, the um, flows, the net currency flows induced by this uh, rebalancing behavior has an effect on the exchange rate. So what do we do to look at, um, at all these, uh, these empirical facts? We uh, look at a panel of international equity fund. Uh, we have uh, all the positions at the stock level uh, between uh, 1999 and 2015 at the quarterly frequency. Uh, we are going to restrict uh, our, ourselves to US, Canada, the UK and the Eurozone, which are the biggest country and they represent a lot of the, uh, of the holdings. So you have here uh, the summary statistics. We have uh, uh, quite a lot of data. Okay, we have uh, more than 20 million uh, positions. Uh, so I will spare you the summary statistics. You can look at them in the in the paper if you are if you are interested. Um, in terms of uh, rebalancing behavior and uh, active versus uh, passive funds. So uh, here. Uh, what we plotted is for the uh, US, UK, Eurozone, Canadian funds. Um, all the active funds are going to be off the 45 degree lines uh, because what we have plotted here is the realized foreign portfolio share. So the observed foreign portfolio share as a function of what would be the foreign portfolio share if you had the uh, funds which were uh, just passively holding the stocks. Okay, and so if you are on the 45 degree line, you could be a passive investor. If you are, uh, if you are on both sides, it means you are actively uh, changing your portfolio. Now, uh, so what are uh, our variables that we are regressing here? So the first thing we have to do is to define a rebalancing variable. So for which uh, we define the passive weight uh, in uh, foreign equity. Uh, for, a, for a fund. So if we divide each portfolio of a fund into a foreign share and a domestic share. We look at what would be the foreign share, the time variation in the foreign share if uh, the fund was not uh, rebalancing, was not changing anything in its, uh, uh, in its holdings. So that would be purely a valuation effect uh, due to the change in the in, in equities, in equity values. And uh, from this, that would be this omega hat, that would be the passive weight in foreign equity. We define the active change as the realized minus uh, the change in uh, inactive weight. And that's gonna be our rebalancing variable. And so the first uh, test uh, of the model is to test for rebalancing. So is it the case that um, we observe this negative co-movement between the rebalancing and uh, the rate of return differential between the foreign share and the domestic share of the portfolio. So we test this with various lags. We allow for country fixed effects, for fund fixed effects. Uh, and we're also going to look at possible asymmetries between um, uh, positive return differential and negative return differential. So anyway, here are the results. So the answer is yes, uh, we see uh, strong evidence for rebalancing in, uh, in our universe of funds. Uh, this is uh, what you can see from the first line where you have all these negative coefficients. It means there is a rebalancing at the fund level between the foreign share and the domestic share. Uh, you see it with some uh, lags as well. So we have uh, the lag values here for one, two lags. Uh, when we look at whether there is a symmetry uh, between positive differential and negative differential, well, it's not obvious. Okay, we don't have strong results on asymmetry. We have um, rebalancing on both sides. And when we split the sample before 2008 and after 2008 because of a crisis, we also uh, don't find uh, very strong evidence for asymmetry before and after the, um, uh, the financial crisis. So the bottom line here is uh, there is rebalancing uh, and uh, it seems to be uh, going through an, uh, in various cuts uh, of the sample. 
What about this interaction between volatility of the exchange rate and, uh, and rebalancing? So here we introduce uh, volatility uh, of uh, the exchange rate and we interact it with uh, our differential variable. And uh, we look at the results. And so what do we find here? We find that when we interact uh, the volatility, uh, we find uh, that there is a uh, uh, a negative coefficient here, which means that uh, there is this interaction between more volatility means more rebalancing. So again, here we find evidence for uh, a bigger wedge when the volatility is higher and therefore a stronger rebalancing uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the equity funds. But you could say, and, and I think it's a, it's a great, it's, a, it's an interesting question, is how heterogeneous are all these effects across uh, the different funds? Because after all, these, uh, these are very different animals potentially. So in order to look at that, we run some quantile regressions where we don't a priori impose um, any uh, structure on the data. We just um, look at the different rebalancing intensities. So just allowing for the slope of this uh, relation between uh, rebalancing and uh, differential in return to be different. And then we will look at whether there is heterogeneity and then we will try to understand that heterogeneity. So when we, when we do that, we find that indeed there is heterogeneity. Everybody is negative. So there is rebalancing going in that universe of funds, okay, regardless of the, of the characteristics. Uh, this is at uh, lag zero, this is at lag one. So you see in both cases, it's negative uh, and there is heterogeneity, very stronger rebalancing at the ends here. So uh, somehow uh, stronger rebalancing is associated with greater sensitivity to the rate of return differential. This is what this uh, quantile regression mean. A stronger rebalancing so bigger delta H in absolute value, whether negative or positive, is associated with stronger sensitivity to the interest rate differential. This is what this quantile regression are, are, are telling you. And, and the, the difference, you know, is, um, can be uh, quite uh, large, even though uh, when we look at the average coefficient, so this is uh, the dotted line here, so you see it's, uh, it's negative, as we found in the regression, but uh, but there are some uh, sizable differences. So it's interesting then to explore who are actually the funds who are creating these um, stronger rebalancing behavior here. And so in order to do that, we just plot the histogram for the characteristic of the funds who are <laughs> gonna be responsible for this stronger rebalancing behavior uh, at these, uh, these two ends of, uh, of, of the variables. And so you see that the ones that are actually associated with stronger rebalancing behavior are, um, uh, are the, small, the smaller funds. So uh, if we look at the size of the fund by quantile, and we see that we know that's where the stronger rebalancing behavior takes place, you see that here you find smaller funds and the bigger funds are in the middle who are not rebalancing as much. Okay, so that's what uh, uh, that's what we, uh, we find. On the other hand, we also uh, explored whether uh, there, there was any kind of heterogeneity that can be explained by the degree of home bias. So the referential in the portfolio, and you see that there is, we don't find much here. There is nothing, it looks. So this is not a relevant um, characteristic. Another relevant characteristic though, is the Herfindahl uh, index. So less diversified funds, the one with higher uh, Herfindahl indices, tends to uh, rebalance more. So less diversified funds and smaller funds are responsible for stronger rebalancing. Very good, so that's what we uh, can say about the uh, testing the model and also uh, exploring this heterogeneous dimension. Now we, uh, we go to the last step empirically, which is can we say anything about these rebalancing flows, which are created by these optimal portfolio behavior and movement in the exchange rate. And in particular, can we get also at the structural parameter kappa, which is this uh, FX elasticity of, of supply. So uh, if we were to regress um, simply the net flow, which uh, comes from the rebalancing behavior of, uh, of the fund, the way we, we modeled it, 
on the exchange rate. So of course we find uh, something uh, uh, something there, but uh, there's a lot of endogeneity in this uh, in this regression for sure. Okay, so uh, we constructed the net flow simply by from the bottom up. So by aggregating uh, the rebalancing behavior of each of our individual funds, and uh, we do we do it for. Uh, uh, for each exchange rate uh, that we look at, uh, so uh, for each currency that we look at. So uh, we, uh, we have to construct these, these flows, which we do, uh, and, uh, and then we, uh, we can run such a regression of net flows into the dollar or into the euro or whatever. Now, sorry, so uh, of course, um, when we uh, uh, do these regressions, there is a lot of endogeneity, uh, lots of common factors that can be driving both uh, the exchange rate and the flows. So what we uh, borrowed here is this uh, neat idea of uh, Xavier Gabex and, uh, and Ralph Koizhan, which is the granular instrumental variable, uh, which consists in uh, using the granularity in the data, and here it's good because we have <laughs> micro data, uh, in order to identify uh, parameters. So uh, we use as instrument um, essentially the uh, granular changes in uh, the mutual fund flows, purging the aggregate flow from the common component. So that's the idea of the GABEX and Cohesion uh, granular, granular instrument. And uh, there are, of course, uh, different ways of constructing this uh, this granular instrument, but uh, just so that you understand the principle, so the, the naive way of constructing it, the easiest way of constructing it, it would be to say, okay, I'm gonna construct an instrument simply by, I take my aggregate flow here, which is a, a weighted uh, aggregate of my individual fund flows, and they are weighted by their size. So the, the big flows, uh, the big funds will have a, a high uh, coefficient and this is the rebalancing of a big fund. Uh, and I subtract, subtract from, that, um, uh, from that construct, from that aggregate, I subtract the equally weighted flows of my funds. So you see that in a simple world in which you have a common component and then idiosyncratic component for each fund, if you do that, if you subtract the average, you are gonna get rid of a common component and you are gonna be left simply with the idiosyncratic granular shocks of the big funds. Okay, that's, that's what you're gonna, you're gonna get. Okay, so that would be a very naive way of, uh, of, uh, of constructing the GIV. Uh, and, but this is the idea behind the GIV by, uh, by essentially subtracting an equally weighted uh, variable here, you get rid of a common component and you just use the idiosyncratic granular shocks to identify uh, your effect. So uh, we uh, actually do that. We do one estimate, which is a very uh, naive one, which is uh, simply using this, uh, this GIV in, in exactly those terms, subtracting the equally weighted um, flows. Uh, but we also construct the GIV in two different ways. Uh, Another way is uh, we are gonna purge the flows by the systematic component which comes from the rebalancing behavior that we have um, identified, okay? So the, uh, and, and there we are gonna take out the heterogeneity that we identify. We know that the big funds rebalance differently from the small funds, so size matters. Size interacted with the return differential matters. Herfindahl index matters, Herfindahl interacted with the return differential matters. So we are gonna clean uh, the flows from this characteristic. So we purge the data from that. That's uh, another uh, construction for the GIV. And then a third construction is to use both these characteristics to purge the data from these characteristics and also to take out a common component of a rebalancing matrix. So we also do that, so we construct GIV1, which is naive, GIV2, taking out the characteristics uh, that we found with the heterogeneous regressions, and three, taking out the characteristics plus common component coming from the rebalancing matrix. So and one, then you have four minutes left. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be fine. So um, once we have these three GIVs, we are going to do the two-stage regression. So we instrument the flows by the GIVs. And then we are going to use this uh, instrument to, uh, to um, estimate the elasticity of supply of uh, foreign exchange. And 
so if our instrument is a good instrument, we get an unbiased estimate of uh, the elasticity of, of supply. So I show you the result here. So first of all, in the first day, the, the GIVs that we construct are, are strong. Okay, so there's uh, no problem of strength of the instrument. And then we, uh, for the second stage, here are the uh, estimates that we, uh, uh, that we find. So you see that uh, uh, the estimates are all in the same ballpark. So essentially we find uh, pretty consistent results. Um, and they are smaller than the OLS, as you would expect, because the OLS had a lot of confounding uh, endogenous factors here. So um, this um, brings me to, my, to the conclusion. Uh, so in this paper, what do we do? So first of all, we, I think we propose a model which uh, is about a joint estimate, a joint determination of equity prices and exchange rate. And we see actually we have common components. If you look at their time variation, it's, it's interesting. We also see um, we generate endogenous gross capital flows. So we can also look at that in the portfolio. So we test the, uh, in the data, we test the rebalancing uh, of the flow, the link between the flow and the excess return differential. We find something compatible with the model. We test uh, the prediction on a fixed volatility, also compatible. We explore heterogeneity in the cross section, which the model didn't tell us about because we had a representative fund at home and, and abroad. So we find interesting the heterogeneity. We use then this heterogeneity and the GIV idea to uh, estimate the supply elasticity of foreign exchange, which is a key parameter in the model. And so what we, what we find there, I just show you the estimate, but how do we translate? Well, uh, we find that roughly for the dollar, a $7 billion flow is associated with a 1% uh, appreciation according to this, uh, to this elasticity estimate. And, um, and that's it. So let me stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Galina. Thank you, Elaine. Um, uh, as a reminder, and then I have a few announcements at the end, so I have an incentive for you to stick around. Uh, but I want to start by thanking um, a lot of people, first the staff and management of Riggs Bank for agreeing to host this meeting and for their flexibility and skill in pivoting from the in-person to the online format, given the current situation. Um, and thanks, Jeffrey, for moderating all the technical aspects. Um, I want to also thank uh, Philip Baqueta for joining forces uh, between SEBRA and CEPR. I think that allowed us to uh, collect what I think was a, a very strong program on a very focused topic. I'm, I've been very happy with, uh, with the presentations and, and the discussions. <clears throat> And so I want to, of course, thank also all the presenters and discussants and the audience participation for making this two days um, super interesting. I could stay awake at five in the morning. So that, that was really great. I took about seven pages of notes. So um, here's what I think my takeaways are. Um, I think I'm not active in the exchange rate literature, so I think I've probably learned a lot and maybe more than some of you. But one thing I learned is that our understanding of the relationship between um, exchange rates, policies, uh, and the economy and the financial markets has advanced substantially uh, since the global financial crisis. In particular, uh, there is a trend in the literature towards deepening our understanding uh, of the financial markets and their contribution to the exchange rate dynamics. Um, so yesterday we had uh, a discussion uh, that was maybe at times uh, controversial, uh, not co people disagreeing with each other, I can't find a word. Um, to me it showed that um, there is very, uh, understanding of the importance of financial frictions and the feedback between real economy and asset markets and how those relationships might be changing over time and across states uh, of the global economy and the policy cycle. This is something that all needs to be considered when we're trying to understand the exchange rates. Today, um, Charles and Elaine uh, showed us the models that are really joining the um, or closing the feedback loop 
on uh, financial markets and the exchange rate market. And uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see those models that we can then build on. Um, however, as uh, you know, with all these advances, there's still a lot that we have to work on. A lot of unanswered questions were brought up yesterday by Phil Lane in his keynote speech. And this morning, um, in a discussion of the paper presented by Gurno, um, we learned that we still need to make progress to better understand monetary policies and um, including the exchange rate regime as, uh, as a um, dimension of a monetary policy and how they impact uh, the global economy. Um, in addition, what makes our life in international finance and macro more complicated is the world is changing rapidly around us, um, raising new issues. And so the discussion of the central bank digital currencies is one of the examples. And the ECB team is showing us a, a good way to incorporate something very new into something that we, are, we can understand and are used to as a, a DSG model. So these are kind of my, my takeaways um, from the last couple of days. Um, a few announcements. So this was the fourth, um, was it the fourth? Yes, the fourth uh, SEBRA uh, IFM program meeting. The next uh, is going to be next fall, and we're just ironing the details, so stay tuned for where and when it's going to take place and the topic. I promise it will be interesting. Uh, closer in the future, CEPR, International Money and Finance Program Meeting, is going to be in December 10 and 11, and the program should be available shortly. We already know the keynote address would be provided by Pierre Olivier Blanchard. And finally, um, Join Sebra at Sebra.org if you have not yet uh, done so. It's free, open to everybody, and that's how we can reach you with the announcements.